So the, the floor is all yours, Ron. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about applying theory to practice. And it really fits in the theme of this conference and the following. So the theme of this conference is uh, finite model theory and multiple value logics. So I have three parts to my talk. Part one combines finite model theory and real value logic, uh, the version of multi value logic we use. Part two is pure finite model theory. And part three is pure uh, real value logic. So it's, I think it fits well in the theme of this conference. Now, I, I, the reason I designed this talk was for the following, because uh, I give this talk, versions of this talk other places. I want to encourage collaboration between theoreticians and, and practitioners or system builders. Uh, and I'm going to do it with these three case studies that I just mentioned. And two of those were initiated by the system builders and one by the theoreticians. And I'll go into this in much more detail. So for theoreticians, uh, to get an idea about how to apply theory to practice and, and to realize that this can lead to better theory. Uh, and, and it's not just a bummer to have to, you know, not just interact with theoreticians, but to find really important new problems. For system builders, uh, the value of theory and the value of involving theoreticians. By the way, I originally called this practitioners, and Laura Haas, who's one of those, said, no, no, call them system builders. They, it's a little, you know, practitioner sounds, I don't know, funny, but system builders are fine. I call them system builders. Okay. Uh, and so they'll learn the value, help to see the value of theory and the value of involving theoreticians. So the first case study went way back to 1996, something called Garlic. And that's, and Laura Haas came up to me. She, at the time, was the first level manager at IBM. Later on, she became the director of computer science. Uh, she became an IBM fellow. Uh, now she's a dean at UMass Amherst. Uh, but at that time, she was a uh, first level manager. We were, we were buddies. And she uh, came to my office, knocked on my door, and said, OK, Mr. Database Theoretician, we've got a problem with garlic, our multimedia database system. I said, oh, great. What's the problem? Well, here's what she explained to me. Garlic is, it combines different systems. It combines DB2, which is IBM's version of a relational database system, it combines Cubic, which is query by image content, where you can query things based on color, shape, and texture, so on, and other stuff. So it's it's trying to incorporate information for all these systems. But here's the problem that Laura gave me. She said, well, Ron, uh, the answers to queries in DB2 are sets. Sometimes they're lags, but in her case, they were sets. <clears throat> And the answers to queries in Cubic are, are sort of lists, like you're looking for red things. Here's the redest, second redest, third redest. She said, how the heck are we going to combine these two things together? They look so different. So I thought, that's a great problem. So example is, let's say you're searching your CD database for artist equals the Beatles. Then you get a set, say, via DB2, a set like this. Uh, these are uh, uh, albums by the Beatles. And now, music brains. Uh, is a big database of, of uh, these, which has 12 million recordings in its database. Uh, and so let's say you had the query album color equals red, uh, and that would give us a, uh, by the way, one of the funny things is things pop up all at once. Well, anyway, it's a little different from when I do it myself. Anyway, album color equals red yields a sorted list. So red is second red is third red is. And actually, a guy named Dick Gabriel, who, who does photographic manipulation, came up with a scheme for measuring redness, which I proved was the unique one with certain nice properties. And that's how we assign these redness numbers. The fourth one looks redness to me, but apparently it's got too much dark pixels in it. But anyway, it gives you a sort of list, say, via, via cubic, the redness thing, albums. Uh, and now, what, how would you make sense of a query like artist equals Beatles and album color equals red? But well, you say, come on, Ron, no big deal. Probably you have a list of albums by the Beatles, sorted by how red they are. What's hard about that? Okay, smart person. What about artist equals Beatles or album color equals red? What do we do then? And what about a, a pure multimedia query? You have color is red and shape is round. How the heck are we going to deal with that? What do we, how do we give answers to that? So uh, let me move my things so I can see what it says here. Oh, what was my solution? Well, here's my solution. Uh, so I realized, first of all, that in Cubic, it wasn't just sorted list, they were scored list. I knew that because I had written a paper with Larry Stockmeyer about a, a weakened triangle inequality in Cubic. And I realized that it doesn't, doesn't say here's the reddest, second reddest, and third reddest, but they have scores, like we saw on that other slide. 
So I thought, huh, well, sets are scored with too. They score zero or one. So suddenly they're on an equal footing. They're both scored with. So, and that reminded me of, of real value logic or fuzzy logic, which is what I called it at the time. And I mean, by the way, we call it real value logic instead of fuzzy because it somehow sounds more scientific. So whatever, I'll say real value logic. So now in real value logic, conjunction is often taken to be the min. This is what uh, uh, we originally uh, done uh, in uh, real value logic and disjunction to max, that's Gerda logic. Uh, and um, so I went back to Laura and said, Laura, I said, oh boy, this is covered up on my side. So I said, Laura, use real value logic. Uh, and she said, great. Uh, she said, I like your solution. But she said, but we need an efficient algorithm that can find the top K while minimizing database accesses. We can't afford to go look at every single, uh, every single thing in the database, find its, all of its scores, and, and then <clears throat> use this combining rule like min or max. She said, you just can't do that. So I thought, huh. So I scratched my head, went back to my office, and came back to a day or two later, said, Laura, good news. <clears throat> uh, if there's n items in the database, uh, uh, I have an algorithm that finds the top K, say K is 10 or so, with only square root of n database access. It's much better than linear. And so Laura said, great, that beats linear. But she says, but we database people are spoiled. We're used to things like B trees, these log n accesses. I'll never forget what she said next. Be smarter, give me a log n algorithm. I oh, man. So I went back to my office, scratched my head, came back to her in a couple of days and said, Laura, I proved you can't do any better than square root of n. That's it. She said, fine, fine, we'll take it. And they implemented that in their system. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's consider time for the access. So that really does make a big difference. Let's say you have 12 million CDs like in Music Brains, and you say you can do 1,000 accesses per second. Well, in accesses, the, the naive algorithm that looks at absolutely everything would take about three hours. Square root of n accesses takes about three seconds. So it really does make a difference to be square root of n rather than n. It really did make a huge difference for that. Okay, now um, I, I want to generalize my algorithm, or they want to generalize it. I didn't want to just use min or anything like that. I want to use arbitrary monotone scoring functions. Uh, I'll find that monotone in a second. You probably know what it is. But decreasing the scores of arguments cannot decrease the overall score. So, uh, <clears throat> so here, so this had a lot of influence. Uh, my algorithm was implemented in garlic, uh, and uh, it influenced a number of other IBM products, including Watson Bundled Search System, Infos for Federation Server, Webs for Commerce. So, and then the paper that introduced my algorithm, which is now called Fagan's algorithm has about 2,000 citations. Uh, but I used Microsoft Academic when I can instead of Google Scholar because it had much more citations. But anyway, that's what I had when I wrote this. So 2,000 citations is very widely cited. But then something happened. Uh, uh, my colleagues, M. Non Mota, Mona, and Hour, and I came up with a new algorithm called the Threshold Algorithm in 2001. And so before I tell you what the threshold algorithm is, let me clarify what the problem is, and then we'll see what the threshold algorithm does. So there are M attributes. We'll take M to be two. We'll imagine their uh, redness and roundness. Uh, and every object in the database has a score for each attribute. So every object has, say, a redness score and a roundness score. Now, the objects are given in M certain list, in this case, two lists, one per attribute. So there's a redness list and a roundness list. And the goal is to find the top K objects according to some monotone scoring function while minimizing access to those lists. That was the problem that or that or wanted. So let's look at an example here, a multimedia example. So here, can you, can you see my cursor here? Yes? No? You can see my cursor? Yep. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, we can see uh, Okay, good. So here, are the, in the upper left object 177, it's really, really red. Its radius is 0.993. But it's pretty mediocre down here in roundness, 406. And here's the reddest, the roundest object, 235, round at 0.999. That's probably a circle. And it's not so great in redness, 0.325. Um, OK. So uh, now scoring functions, uh, what FBR scoring function, popular choices are, are min, as I said, often used in, in real value logic, average. Uh, so uh, and if x1 through xn are the scores of object r under the m attributes, just like the redness score and the roundness score, 
then F of it is the overall score. You take the min, you take the average, whatever your, your uh, rule is. You might maybe write F of R for F of X squared through XM. Now, a scoring function is monotone if whenever the X size are less than the Y eyes, then F of the X size is less than equal to F of the Y eyes. Okay, so um, modes of access. Well, <clears throat> there are two modes of access. There's sorted or sequential access. Say, so give me the reddest object, give me the next reddest object, give me the next most red object, and so on. Well, that's sorted access. This is how, for example, it works in cubic. Uh, I didn't make these up. That's actually what the real system did. And random access. So you, maybe you see an object in the uh, sorted access. Uh, it's really, really red. You say, how round is it? Well, random access, you, you came to score of this object R for the attribute. You say, what's the roundness of this object? Uh, we already know it's redness, but it's roundness. And we want to minimize total number of accesses. Here, I'm not going to distinguish between sorting and random access, but sometimes people do. Here, for, we're just for terms of this talk, just minimizing total number of accesses. So now, uh, here's, so we want an algorithm that finds the top K objects. Well, now the naive algorithm simply looks at every single object in the database, every single one of them, gets every score for it, its redness score and around the score of every single object, for example, and then combine the top K. Way too expensive. So uh, instead, let me tell you how the threshold algorithm works. Uh, here's how it works. Uh, you do sorted access in parallel to each of the sorted lists. You, in parallel, are looking at the redness score, the roundness score. You find the reddest and the roundness. Then you find the second reddest and second roundness, and so on. You do those in parallel. And as you see an object under sorted access, you go to random access to get its values in the other list. So if you've seen a, a redness score high up under the list, you now say, what's its roundness score? Then we compute its overall score, because now you know redness score and roundness score. So you can use your function f, which says the min. Uh, to find it. And then if this is one of the top K answers we've seen so far, remember it, otherwise throw it away. It doesn't have a chance to be in the top K. And now, uh, you know, here, what's our stopping rule? When do we stop? Well, here's the stopping rule. Uh, for each I, let T sub I be the score of the last object you saw under sorted access in that list, like T sub roundness, T sub redness. So the last object you saw in the redness list, what is, what is it score? That's T sub redness. Uh, and then here's our uh, what the algorithm says. To find the threshold value to be f of those ti's. Now that may not be the score of any object in the database, but that's okay. They're numbers. It makes mathematical sense to compute those, so we can do that. Um, and we want to, and, and the, here's the stopping rule. As soon as you see k objects whose overall score is at least the threshold t, and its value f of t1 through tn, stop and output those top k values. That's going to be your top k. So why does this work? Well, let's see why this works. Uh, let's, let's, well, first, let's take example data. So here's the reddest object, 177. Here's the roundest object, score point uh, 999. Then now we go and say, what's the roundest score of object 177? Well, it's 0. 0.406. What's the reddest score of this object 235? Well, it's 0.325. So at this point, the overall score we got for these so far Object number 177 has a score, we're using min in this example, a min of 0.993 and 0.99, uh, 0 0.993 and 0.406, which is 0.406. For object 235, it's a min of 0.325 and 0.999, which is 0.325, and so on. We keep going. Uh, and now, what is the, at this point, what is the threshold? Well, the last object you saw in the redness list had score 0.993. The last object you saw in the roundness, 0.999. So the threshold is the min of those two numbers. 0.993. And then we keep going. Uh, uh, and there's the next object in the list. And just I'll show you what the uh, threshold is. How now the threshold is just dropped. It's the min of 0.991 and 0.996, those two red objects. So the threshold is steadily dropping. Then we find the next one. Now the threshold is dropping again. It's the min of 0.982 and 0.992. So it's steadily dropping and you're keeping track of your scores. Um, so now, uh, uh, oh, so 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 anyway, the, the threshold there was 0.992. Okay, let me go to the next slide. Uh, so now, why why is this a, a correct algorithm? Why is it safe that a good safe time to stop after uh, you have k objects? You always take that threshold value. Well, suppose the current top k objects you found so far have scores at least t, the current threshold 
we want to show it's okay to stop at that point. If, if not, what could go wrong? Well, the subobject R that's never appeared in any of the list, it's unseen. S is in our current top K, but the score of R is bigger than the score of S. So we screwed up. This is what could go wrong. I'll prove that you can't go wrong. Why is that? Well, R has scores X1 through XM. It's radius score and surrounding score. You haven't seen it yet. So it's value, it's XIs are less than or equal to TI. Uh, the TI is the uh, threshold for, for that thing like that radius around this. So X i is less than or equal to TI because R has not been seen before. So what's F of R? Well, if F of the X1 through XM, which by monotonicity is less than or equal to F of T1 through TM, that number is the threshold T. And, uh, and since we stopped at object S, we lose our list because its score was at least T, we have uh, F of S is greater or equal to T. And there's our contradiction. Up above, we have F of R is bigger than F of S. And down here, we have F of R less than or equal to F of S. So this awful, this bad thing can't happen. So the threshold algorithm is correct. It does give you the right answer. Okay, so, uh, so now uh, I'm going to tell you about a notion for our paper called we call it instance optimality, which is a really neat, neat property. Uh, so you have a class of algorithms. Uh, uh, and you know what the, what are the legal operations you can do, like you can look things uh, sorted ways and random ways. And you have a class of legal inputs. And for every algorithm A in our class A and every database D or object D in our legal input, there's a cost. Uh, it could be number of objects touched. It could be uh, it could be uh, amount of storage. It could be whatever cost is for you. Cost and uh, running algorithm A on database D, some non-negative value. Now here's our definition of instance optimal. An algorithm is instance optimal over A and D if there are constants C1 and C2 where for every A prime. Well, imagine the adversary picks it. The adversary picks. His own, his own algorithm A prime, the, uh, the adversary picks his own database D and, and he says, okay, buddy, can you do as well as I do? Well, the cost of running our algorithm A on the uh, adversary's D is within a constant factor. C1 times the cost of the adversary's algorithm on the adversary's database plus C2. We'll cost C1 the optimality ratio. So it's doing really, really well. Uh, it's doing uh, within a constant factor of what the uh, uh, adversary did by picking his own algorithm in his own database. He can tailor his algorithm to the database. My goodness gracious, this is a tough thing to be. He ta tailors his algorithm in his database and, uh, and he still went. Now, let me just give you an idea why this is hard to do. I'll show you something that's not instance optimal, binary search. Um, binary search is a totally different set of rules. In binary search, you're given a sorted list of numbers and you're handed some other number uh, uh, K and you ask, is K in this sort of list? So the way binary search works, it let's say the list is a size 2,000, it goes to halfway in between position 5,000, says what's the, what is, you can ask what appears at a given spot. What appears at spot 5,000, if it's less than this number K you're looking for, then you know it's somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000, so you go halfway between 7,500 and ask for the score there. So you're always able to ask for the score at a given location. Uh, but now, let me show you why this uh, binary is just not instant optimal. Here's what the, this nasty adversary does. This nasty adversary has a list of, say, 10,000 items, and he, he notices that object 1001 is in the list, and it's in position 597. So what he says, it's okay, smart guy. Uh, here's my big list of 10,000 things. Uh, Find out if if and the object point five nine position five ninety seven is a thousand one. He says it's a thousand one in the list. So you got to do binary search. The algorithm for the, the, that the uh, adversary uses is go to position five ninety seven and ask what's there, and then do binary search. So it's a correct algorithm. If it's not there, do a binary search. So it's a correct algorithm, but he gets in one guess, taking you log n guesses. So. So binary search is not instance optimal. So it just shows you how hard it is to be instance optimal. In fact, I studied the literature to find other instance optimal algorithms. It's hard to find. It's really a very difficult thing to attain. Uh, so um, uh, now I'll t talk about instance optimality of the threshold algorithm. So the intuition about why it's instance optimal is that if you stop any sooner, uh, the next object you see 
it's, then you explore might have that threshold values and values, so you better not stop before that. But unfortunately, life is a bit more delicate, so we have to be a little more careful than that to say this is optimal. Here's why. So um, let's define the notion of a wild guess. A wild guess is something where you do random access to some object you've never, just out of the blue, it hasn't appeared in any of these lists under, uh, you've done under sorted access. You say, you know, I'm just curious, uh, object number 2,458, uh, uh, I would, I would uh, I would to use this. I'm going to do random access uh, for this object you've never even seen before. Um, and you know, there it turns out you can do really well, but, but it's, it's really an illegal kind of thing to do. Yet you're making lucky guesses. Neither the Fagan's algorithm, that first algorithm, nor the threshold algorithm use wild guesses. In fact, it might even be forbidden by your, your system. It might not even allow wild guesses. So here's our theorem. For every monotone f, like min or average, let a be the class of uh, algorithms that correctly finds the top k answers. This is for our, the problem we're asking about. It correctly finds the top k answers uh, with scoring function f for every database. It's a correct algorithm and does not make wild guesses. And let d be the class of all databases that, that are being accessed. Then the threshold algorithm is instance optimal over over A and D. So we proved it is a stop. And by the way, something interesting that happened is the late David Johnson was visiting me at IBM and he came to my office and I told him about very proudly about this optimality. And he said, Well, Ron, I think you should demand something even more. Not only all the conditions you give, but it should have the have the best possible optimality ratio. I said, Oh man. So I went and calculated it. And it turns out this somewhat complicated thing. If M is the number of lists like uh, at like two for radius and roundness, then here is the optimality ratio of the threshold algorithm. M plus M times M minus one has the cost of a random access divided by the cost of the, of the sorted access. And I also proved that's best possible, the best possible optimality ratio. So this is David Johnson optimal, the instance of the threshold algorithm. It not only is instance optimal, it even has the best possible optimality ratio. So um, I went to see Laura, and this is, and I said, Laura, we got this new algorithm, that threshold algorithm. It's even better than Sagan's algorithm, the one you had originally, uh, the one you've implemented in garlic. It's optimal in a stronger sense. And Laura said, Ron, you told me your algorithm is optimal. I said, well, Laura, there's optimal, and then there's optimal. So uh, that's great of is still optimal, but you know, this is optimal in a stronger sense. Uh, it always at least as well and sometimes better than the uh, Fagan's algorithm. So influence. Well, uh, first of all, it's kind of funny. We submitted the paper with the threshold algorithm to the 2001 Pods conference, and I was really worried. I thought, you saw the threshold. It's pretty simple. It takes something like 11 lines to describe. And I thought, man, oh, man, they're going to reject it. They're going to say, hey, we're in the top database theory conference. We're going to accept a paper with an 11 line algorithm. Give me a break. We'll reject it. So I thought, how am I going to prevent them from doing that? So I thought, aha, I'll call it a remarkably simple algorithm. I call it that in both the abstract and by the paper. We have a remarkably simple, like, turn bugs into features. This is from your writing papers, turn bugs into features. I turn it into a feature. And paper actually won, not only was accepted, but won the best paper award. Uh, and the paper was very influential. It had 4, 000, has 4,000 citations. It won the Test of Time Award uh, in 2011 for looking back 10 years, what had the most influence. Um, I won the IEEE Technical Achievement Award uh, for Fagan's algorithm and the threshold algorithm. Those two together, I won this. And then the, the glory is we won the Gurdle Prize. The Gurdle Prize is the highest award in theoretical computer science. Uh, and this is the only database paper ever to win the Gurdle Prize. So we won the Gurdle Prize for this paper. And then, by the way, rather than come later, Pods decided that something called Gems of Pods, the best papers ever appearing in Pods. And they'll, each conference will have one or two of them. So ours was the first one. So uh, application threats. I'm not going to bore you by reading this list, but it's got a gazillion applications. It's just used all over the place. Uh, people find it extremely useful this threshold algorithm to use in a vast number of, of places. Um, so now measures of success. Well, measures of success for a practitioner is uh, making our products better. 
Uh, that's the ultimate measure of success for practitioners. Uh, for theoreticians, creating a new subfield, that's an ultimate measure of success for theoreticians. Now, I can't make a stronger argument than this that it's good for theoreticians to interact with practitioners and work on practical problems. This paper arose by solving a real life practical problem. A problem Laura has knocked on my door and said, please solve this problem. It, it can't wait out of that. I mean, a paper that arose by solving a real life practical problem won the girl prize. It's like all hanging fruit. You know, no one's thought about that problem before. Uh, and you, you're thinking about it and you come up with a great answer. Okay, that's into that case study where you see I combined both uh, finite model theory and real life logic. The second one is going to be pure uh, finite model theory, Clio. Um, and what, what happened, Clio deals with data exchange. I'm fine with that. It's the second, which where you convert data from one format to another. Now, when Laura Haas, after Garlick, started a new project, Clio, the data exchange, I followed. I thought, man, I was very successful. You know, listening in on her stuff before, who knows it'll happen again. So I actually attended Clio meetings for a full year, listening to what they were doing on data exchange. Then for Keon, for Keon Coitus, Renee Miller, which in Popa and I decided the following. Let's ignore all the stuff they've done in the last year for data exchange. Let's start from scratch. Let's deal with uh, fundamental principles, lay the foundations using fundamental principles for data exchange. By the way, the reason this picture is so young of Renee Miller, she, she does not want her picture to appear publicly uh, on public websites. So she said I could use her three-year-old pictures and that's why she's so young. She wasn't really a child prodigy, age three, helping us with this. So let's go on now, uh, talk about data exchange. So you're translating data from one sort of format to another. It could be from some non-relational format into relational, or it could be from relational into a different relational with a different set of attributes. I'll give an example of that in just a second. So you're converting data. So here's an example, and this could arise in real life. Let's say two companies merge. One of them has an employee manager database, and the other company has an employee department, department manager database. And you want to convert that first one into the second one. So let's talk about how you might do this. So what you do is you establish some relationship between the source, this employee manager thing, and the target, this employee department, department manager. Uh, that's called the schema mapping. We specify things tuple, called tuple generating dependencies, which arose in other contexts. Uh, it was originally used to help specify normal forms for relational databases. So in this case, here's what it would be. It would say if employee E and department M are an employee manager relation, then there exists a department D where ED is an employee department relation, uh, relation and DM is a department manager relation. That's the uh, PGD that we're going to use to characterize how we want this thing to, to work. So now let's look at an example, and I'm going to give you three possible solutions. Now, when I give this talk in person, I have people vote on the best solution. Here, you'll have to do your own private vote since you're not doing that. And tell, see if you come up with the solution we did. So here's our source. We have Gurdle. This is quite an apartment. Gurdle reports to Hilbert. Turing reports to Hilbert, and Hilbert reports to Gauss. Quite an apartment. So, so now here's three possible solutions to how you can do the data exchange, how you convert it to employee department, department manager. Well, the first way you might do it is say, well, let's name the department after the manager. So Gilbert's, Gurdle's in the Hilbert department, Turing's in the Hilbert department, Gilbert's in the Gauss department, and then Hilbert manages the Hilbert department, and Gauss manages the Gauss department. That's method one. Method two is you have these new values, null values, brand new things you, you cook out, uh, you never used before. You say, you say Gurdle and, and Turing in department D1, and, and right here, you see that, and D1 is managed by Hilbert, Hilbert's in D2, which is here managed by Gauss. Now, solution number three, you say, wait a second. What if Gurdle and Hilbert in turn are different departments and both managed by Hilbert? So you say, Gurdle's in department D1, Turing's in department D2, Hilbert man Hilbert's in department D3, D1 and D2 are both managed by Hilbert, D3 is managed by Gauss. So now, quietly think to yourself, which solution do you like? What is the answer we came up with and why? So now you've quietly made your vote. By the way, I do voting in real life. It's really scattered and many people do not get the quote unquote right answer. So, uh, so here's why, here, what solutions should we produce? Well, we define the notion of a universal solution. That's something as general as possible, meaning it's got a homomorphism into all the other solutions. Now, third, the third solution is universal. 
So it's the most general, it makes the least assumptions, it's got a homomorphism into all the other solutions. So that's our answer, the third solution. I don't know if you correctly voted for that or not. Uh, but now we might have some other target, some target constraints, stressed by things called equality generating dependencies or EGDs. Here's an example. It says if D is a manage, if DM is in department manager relation and D prime M is in department manager relation, then D equals D prime. So this says each manager manages at most one department. So in that case, uh, if that were a target constraint, the second solution would have been universal. So uh, how do we obtain a universal solution? Well, there's a well-known mechanical procedure called the chase. And I'll show you an example in just a second. And it's originally used as a tool in database design. And we use the chase to generate the target from the source efficiently. So for example, going back to our TGD uh, we had before, if EM is an employee manager relation, then ED is an employee department relation, and DM is an apartment manager relation. What we do is we consider each type of employee manager relation, Girdle, Hilbert. We create a, a new uh, uh, tuple in the ED relation, uh, Girdle D and, and DM in the department manager relation. Uh, D is some newly introduced label null. So that's what, how the chase works. We, we uh, create the, this edge essentially quantified object using brand new fresh uh, nulls. And now the, and the EGDs would tell us to be equate label nulls. For example, the manager can manage only a department and might, it would equate two of these label nulls. And so uh, now uh, another thing we came up with, just sort of independently, but because we're working on this, was composition, because someone asked us, how do you compose these schema values? Let's say you have, uh, a uh, way of data exchange way to go from D1 to schema one to schema two. You have a way to go from schema two to schema three. How do you go directly from one to three? So we thought at first, oh, well, whatever the TGDs you use, the first one, the TGDs, the second one, you combine them in some interesting way to get the result in the third one. But we were shocked to realize we couldn't make that work because Fokian and Uchin Pope and Wang Chu and I worked on that. We studied this composition and we realized to our shock that this composition could take us out of first order logic. That even though those TGDs you saw were all first order logic, they're existentially quantified things, uh, composition took us out of first order logic. Uh, we found what the right language was, we call it second order TGDs, which are actually pretty easy to work with, and we gave an algorithm for composition. Uh, so now, measures of success. So, uh, our stuff was used in, D, in DB2 Control Center, Rational Data Architect, uh, Content Manager. These are all IBM products. What they did is they used, first of all, they were finding these goofy solutions. They showed me the data. They were very attractive. He said, no, 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 no. Use universal solutions. That's what you should come up with. And, and we gave them an algorithm for computing universal solutions. We gave them an algorithm for composing schema mapping, and they implemented all that stuff. So now, uh, what became of this stuff? Uh, well, our initial paper, uh, the one where we introduced uh, uh, this data exchange, uh, it, it ICDT is like the second best conference in databases, the International Conference in Database Theory, uh, we some second best conference in database theory. It, it won the Test of Time Award. So 10 years later, they looked back and said that paper had a big impact. And in fact, uh, I got a letter from the journal appeared in the theoretical computer science TCS. And I got a letter from the editor in chief saying, Congratulations, your paper was the second most highly cited paper of the decade in, that, in our journal. I sent him back a note saying, Okay, what was the first most highly cited? And he said, Well, it was a survey paper. We felt a little bit bad about making that the most highly cited, but what can we say? That's what happened. So, fine. Uh, now, our paper on uh, composition, when the Test of Time Award for Pods 10 years later. And uh, I had a follow up composition paper with uh, Reynas and Nash that won the 2010 ICDT Best Paper Award. Uh, but um, uh, let's go to Influence and talk about stuff. First of all, this work created a new subfield. Suddenly, special sessions on data exchange occurred in every major conference. And, and now here's the one that Guillermo uh, uh, mentioned. For our 2003 initial paper and 2004 composition paper together, we won the two years ago the Alonzo Church Award, which is the highest award for logic and computation for given for quote 
here's the rules for an outstanding contribution represented by a paper or small group of papers within the past 25 years. So our work on data exchange, that first paper and the competition paper together won the Girdle Prize. I mean, the Alonzo Church Award. So uh, good, third case study. This is gonna be pure real value logic. This is very recent, started in 2020, and uh, it's still working on it. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, I'm working on it uh, with our two conference organizers. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, so uh, classical versus real value logics. Well, you, although you all know I would uh, to be self-contained, I'm gonna go ahead and say some things about real value logic. In classical logic, formulas take on the values zero for false or one for true. In real value logics, formulas can take on any old real value typically restricted to being in, in the interval zero, one. So not just zero, one, it could be a half. Now this work arose actually in real life, part of this illogical neural net project at IBM where they're having neural gates and the inputs can be uh, uh, things with various values. You're taking an and of two things and they're not just zero, one, but and of two things, one is value 0.5, one is value 0.7. So it actually rose. And so uh, I mentioned that here, the inputs with an AND gate could be any number in zero, one. And now this, the, actually the manager of that project who happens to be my manager, he's an IBM vice president. He said, Ron, we need a sonic reaxonization for real value logics, go get one. So I said, oh, okay. So here's the story. Uh, so first of all, let's get, in real, in real value logics, well, here are the rules, the fuzzy logic rules. So and does the right thing with zero or one. The and of zero and x is zero. The and of one and x is x. It's monotone if x1 less than y1, x2 less than y2, then x1 and x2 less than equal to y1 and y2. It's commutative, x1 and x2 is the same as x2 and x1, and it's associative. You can put the parenthesis either way when you're taking the and. And there's similarly, there's rules for or. The or does the right thing with zero and one. Zero or x is x, and one or x is one. And then just as before, it's monotone, commutative, and associative. Okay, so um, now common choices for and and or. Uh, uh, Girdle logic, where it's the it's the min, that's the original form of fuzzy logic, is this. Uh, x1 and x2 is the min of x1 and x2, x1 or x2 is the max of x1 and x2. Well, you say this logic, which has mentioned a number of times in this conference so far, x1 and x2 is, it's basically x1 plus x2 minus one, but you want to keep it in the interval zero, one. So that, that could go bigger than one. So you take the max, I mean, that could go less than one, less than zero, I'm sorry. So you take the max zero and those values. The or of it basically is, it's you add them together, x1 plus x2, but that could get bigger than one, so you take the min of one and x1 plus x2. That's Wilkershavis logic. And there's also product logic, the, sorry, another common logic. x1 and x2 is the product of x1 and x2. x1 or x2 is x1 plus x2 minus x1 times x2. Okay, so now um, negation. Well, negation, Wilkershavis logic is what you would hope it should be. Not x is one minus x, so if x is 0.7, not x is 0.3. And now in Gurdle logic and product logic for various reasons, uh, which I'm not thrilled with, but that's what they do. You take not x to be one if x is zero and otherwise it takes on the value zero. So that's the way it's done. It's basically something like x implies zero and you work backwards from that. Anyway, so uh, now there's anomalies in real value logic. So there's a, to me, one of the most interesting theorems in, in fuzzy logic called the bellman Burtz theorem as modified by Yeager and Duwa Prudet has said the following. We want the property that whenever single one and sigma two are formulas that involve only conjunction and disjunction. So there's absolutely no negations there, just conjunction of this stuff or the disjunction of that and the blah, blah, blah. Uh, then we'd like sigma and sigma, sigma one and sigma two to be equivalent in ordinary propositional logic if and only if they are they're guaranteed to always take on the same value in real value logic. So equivalent in propositional logic if only they're equivalent in real value logic. That's a, a wonderful thing you'd love to have. And then the theorem says, there's only one way to do that. Conjunction has to be uh, the max uh, and disjunction has, no, conjunction and disjunction have to be the, yeah, the max and the min respectively. Uh, I guess I got this backwards here. Conjunction uh, is the min and disjunction is the max. So that's what it has to be. Uh, that's a, a wonderful theorem that I, I've always liked. Uh, 
So let's show an example of things going wrong. So consider x and x. Well, certainly in ordinary logic, that value is x. And it does the right thing in Gerda logic because the min of x and x is x. But it does the wrong thing, and we can save it in product logic. If x is 0.6, then we can save it logic. The value of x and x is the max of 0, and 0 0.6 plus 0 0.6 minus 1, which is 0.2, is not 0.6. And product logic, the value is 0.6 times 0.6 is 0.36. So uh, those logics, they don't satisfy this property. X and X is not going to be equivalent to X uh, in these logics. Uh, but if things go wrong even in Gerda logic. It says the negations are on. You no longer have the bellman gertz theorem that we know. So although Gerda logic preserves equivalence in firmness not involving negation, it does not preserve equivalence if there is negation around. And here's an example. X or not X. Well, that's a tautology in ordinary logic. Uh, but it's not a valid form in Gerda logic. If x is 0.5, then not x has a value 0. So x or not x has a value the max of 0.5 and 0, which is 0.5, not 1. And even if we had done not x is 1 minus x, we still would have the same thing. It would be the max of 0.5 and 0.5, which is 0.5, not 1. So even Gerda logic has its anomalies. It's, we just can't get it to correspond with propositional logic. Uh, OK, so now what was now, I wanted to find a class of sets using this real life logic uh, and get a sound and complete explanation for it. So, well, so I have to get my talk tomorrow. What's that? Say again? You know, I think he. I think, no, Carl, no, I think, I think that this, this was an accident. Someone spoke by accident. I think that this was, I muted oh. them now. Sorry. Uh, okay, no problem. So, uh, I thought it might be Carl saying that's what we did in our paper, which we're coming up to later. Uh, tomorrow. Anyway, so it would have to be the set of formulas, such as sigma 1 or sigma 2 or sigma 1 and sigma 2 are formulas. So my first thought is, here's what I want my sentences to be. These are the form uh, of theta's real number in 0, 1. I want it to be sigma comma theta, meaning the value of sigma is theta. But it has expressivity problems, I realize right away. So, so for example, uh, let's say, uh, we have sigma 1 or sigma 2 takes on the value 0.6. Uh, so what does that tell us about, about sigma 1 and sig, sigma 1 theta, these magic sigma 1 theta sentences that I'm trying to get, where, where or is the max? Well, it's pretty awful. It gives us an infinite disjunction. Uh, the, it says the value of theta is less than 0 0.6. So if it, in fact, it's even uncountable infinite disjunction that you get uh, that, that tells us what the value of sigma 1 is. That's pretty awful. So I thought, man, this is not for me. I, I need to get a better class of sentences. So I thought, oh, I'll try sentences sigma comma s, where s is a set, is a, is a set of values. But uh, great. So in that case, that infinite disjunction becomes something very reasonable. It's just sigma 1 is in the interval point 0 to 0.6. It's so not great. But then I discovered there's expressivity problems, even with these sentences sigma comma s. So, uh, so I found the following theorem. that a fate is between 0 and 1. And then look at same as logic. No finite Boolean combinations of senses in the form sigma 1 comma s or sigma 2 comma s is equivalent to sigma 1 or sigma 2 takes on the value of theta. So, so bummer. So I've got, got to get e either even richer than sigma comma s senses. Uh, Need and rich. So here's, here's what I came up with. Here's my class of senses I, I invented, uh, which is, by the way, is new. I, I've read this by experts in, in uh, Fuzzy logic like uh, Godo, and they say, no, no, this is all new. Um, he said, uh, so I let sigma 1 comma sigma 2 ask me that if, sigma, if S1 is a value of sigma 1 and S2 is a value of sigma 2, then the pair S1 and S2 is in the set S. So now we're talking about combinations of values. And if F sub R is the value of sigma 1 or sigma 2 in this particular logic, uh, like uh, it would be the max in Gerda logic, uh, and then, um, uh, and then we can say this logic could be min of one and s one and s two. Then we want to say uh, uh, so. If we have this f sub or, then let s be the set of all s one s two, where the f sub or of s one and s two is 0. 0.6. So that tells us exactly what you can infer about sigma one and sigma two, the combination sigma one and sigma two together, uh, given that the or is 0.6. You get exactly, if that's your set S, you get exactly the right thing. Sigma 1, sigma 2, S gives you exactly the combinations of sigma 1 and sigma 2 that do the job. 
So, so more generally, I define my class of senses to be things of the form sigma one through sigma k s, uh, where uh, s is in zero one to the k, uh, and we're in sigma one and sigma two are formulas. So what this sentence says is exactly the following: It says that if s one is the value of sigma one and s two is the value of sigma two, and so on, uh, so then for for each of these, for i between one and k, uh, the tuple s1 through sk is in the set s. That's exactly what the meaning of that sentence is. Again, this sentence here says that you take the value of s1 and the value of s2 and so on, uh, that that tuple must appear in the set s. That's the, that's the meaning of that sentence. So now uh, a model, I need a notion of a model. We, we were propositional logic, so we have a finite set of primitive propositions. Now we define a model to be a function that assigns a value to each primitive proposition, some value in the interval zero one, because we're in real value logic. Now for every fixed real value logic, a model of a sentence or of a set of sentences is simply a model where that sentence or that set of sentences holds, the usual notion of a model. And uh, now, here's my exposition. I, I, I have seven actually, I don't have time to give them all, but I'll give you the flavor of them by giving you two of them and then the most important one. So here's an example of my inference rules in my logic. Remember, it's trying to get a sonic like exposition. So I say, if sigma one through sigma k is s, from then you can first sigma through sigma k s prime, if s is contained in s prime, that's certainly obviously sound. Uh, if a tuple of values of sigma one through sigma k is an s, then they're certainly going to be an s prime. And another uh, one of my rules is sigma one through sigma k s one and sigma one through sigma k s two. From that, I infer sigma one through sigma k s one and s two. That's certainly sound. If if the tuple uh, values of sigma one through sigma k is an s one, it's an s two. Then it's certainly in the intersection. Uh, and now, now I'm going to give you my most important rule, uh, the key inference rule, the most complicated rule. So now, what we do is the following: Well, consider a, a a tuple to be good, a tuple S is good if it does the right things with the things in it. So this condition, if, if sigma sub n is sigma i or sigma j, then the value of, of sigma n, the S sub n is F sub or of S i S j, you know, using whatever the or is in your particular logic. This works for any old, any old real value logic and similarly for n. And if sigma j is not sigma i, then S, the value of, sig, of sigma j S j is uh, whatever the not is in that logic, s of or, s of not of uh, uh, si. So that's a good tuple, and s prime contains just the good tuples. So it's a very local property. So you take those tuples in s that, that, that combine things together in the right way, those are the good tuples, and then s prime contains exactly the good tuples. It's a very local property. Uh, so now, now, let's talk about properties of maximization before I give you a theorem. So an actualization is what we call it strongly complete if whenever gamma is a finite set of sentences in that logic and tau is a single sentence uh, that is uh, uh, a logical consequence uh, of tau. In other words, every model of gamma is also a model of tau. We define already a model. Then there's a proof of tau from gamma. So it's, it, does, it does the right things. It, it, the, uh, uh, and, it's and an actualization is weakly complete if whenever gamma is the empty set that things hold. So it's weakly complete uh, if there's a proof of every valid sentence. So the proofs are strong enough. They're strong enough to do the right thing. They can, if you know, it's weakly complete, if all the guys in gamma have the value one, then so does its consequence tau. Okay, so now, and we'll in the usual notion, the sound doesn't actualize your sound, but whenever there's a proof of tau from gamma, then gamma logically implies tau. That's always, not always, but usually the easy part. So theorem, my exposition is sound and strongly complete. And the wonderful thing about it is it works for basically any real value logic. Uh, it, I mean, because uh, we have F sub or there for whatever that or is in that logic, F sub n for every and is. So our exposition allows us to derive exactly what information can be inferred about the combinations of values of a collection of formulas given information about the combinations of values of several other collections of formulas. So that's exactly what it's doing. That's what our senses look like. 
uh, giving you values, uh, information about combinations of values, and uh, and we do it. Uh, and uh, now I just remarked that for various real value logics in the literature, there are some sound and complete associations, some strongly complete, some weakly complete. But by being parameterized, because I have like the F sub R and F sub N, something I'm really thrilled with is optimization is the first one that works simultaneously for all these real value logics. It's great. I love that. Um, so uh, now it turns out that in this logical neural network project, they needed weights. Uh, what is the weight the importance of things? So you have the end of sigma one and sigma two, but you care twice as much about sigma one and sigma two, maybe based on you know other information you've seen in this logical neural net. So you want to weight the importance of them. Uh, how the heck would you do that? Well, uh, for example, for example, for sigma one or sigma two, you might want to assign weight w one to sigma one and weight w two to sigma two. Well, there's various ways to do it. And we can say this logic, a natural thing to do is the following: if the value of sigma one is s one and the value of sigma two is s two, we may take the weighted value of sigma one or sigma two to be not the min of one and s one plus s two, but the min of one and w one s one plus w two s two. That's a very natural way to incorporate weights. And uh, and we can now I can easily extend my exercisation to include weights. So instead of using like f sub r of s1 s2, I'll now have f sub r of s1 s2 w1 w2. So what is the value of the or uh, of s of these sets of sigma one and sigma two? Sigma one is the value of s1, sigma two is the value of s2, and sigma one is the weight w1, and sigma two is the weight w2. And just use those, and the, the, the exercisation goes through completely. It's still still uh, it's still sound and strongly complete. So uh, now with Ryan Regal, I mean, developed an efficient decision procedure for many cases, for many natural cases, for deciding implication of Lucas Avich and Gertel. I don't want to go into any details, but uh, in that cases and the natural cases, you can find a polynomial if I'm not. Now, here's my final slide pointing to tomorrow. So uh, uh, with, with Guillermo and Carlos, uh, we extended the sound and clearization to cover not just propositional real value logic, but also first order real value logic. So tune in tomorrow. Thank you. Oh, conclusions. I forgot I have conclusions. Sorry. So, conclusions. Remember, I was trying to convince theoreticians and practitioners to work together. So, uh, uh, con consulting with uh, theoreticians is useful in and of itself. And in fact, by doing that, you can uh, you get a fresh outlook, and you may even understand the problem better. So I get a quote from my academic grandfather, Albert Einstein. Now you may say, he's your academic grandfather? So in the Q&A, you can ask me, how's your academic grandfather, Ron? So I'll answer that. If no one does, I'll just say it. So anyway, um, so here's a quote from Albert Einstein. He says, if I had an hour to solve a problem, and my life depended on it, on the answer. I spent the first 55 minutes figuring out the proper questions to ask. For if I knew the proper questions, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. So Einstein himself is, is saying this. Uh, principal approaches can improve your product. It can make it more efficient. Uh, it can, um, and, and better new algorithms can differentiate your product. You're better than other people because you've got new algorithms. They're better algorithms, uh, and your algorithm analysis by these pointy-headed theoreticians can provide performance expectations, and it can provide product guarantees. We guarantee that it still takes such and such time. So all of those wonderful things from working with theoreticians, and you can make abstractions. For example, uh, Laura extended from f being the min to Laura to any old monotone squaring function in Garland. So abstraction can expand the function of your product. Uh, now. Uh, Conclusions for theoreticians. Uh, involvement with system builders can help your theory. Uh, novel questions we ask. A perfect example is that when Laura asked me in, in the first part of the talk, it was a novel question that had never been asked before, and by golly, it led to the Nobel Prize. New models and new interesting areas of study will arise. You're, it's again low hanging fruit. You're being asked stuff people have not thought about before. Instead of doing the 17th iteration of some problem that everyone's it's already in the 16th iteration. You've got a brand new problem. No one's ever worked on it before. You're the very first one. You're the very first person to study that problem and to give an algorithm for it. Implementations can reveal weaknesses. I mean, I'll just briefly mention 
at one point, this guy at IBM put his arm around me and said, Ron, we're, we're doing this uh, uh, storage manager and uh, typically storage manager. And we need to do differential backup, meaning if you have this huge database, a, a huge file, and you make a very tiny change, that was in the old days. It was really hard to, to store lots of information. He says, we don't want to send over the whatever wires we have, the entire change. The data is we just want to send over the changes. And so I, th I thought, aha. So I, with some others, came up with something we call differential backup uh, that does exactly that. Now it's actually very, very widely used. And one of the people working with us on that was a practitioner who, who he actually implemented various aspects of this and discovered that for very large uh, files, we had some weaknesses, so we improved the algorithm to deal with that. So implementation can reveal weaknesses in your theory. And your theory will be relevant. Uh, it will have practical impact, which is wonderful. Now I think I'm done. Yep, that's my last slide. Thank you.